Ja. Hi. <laughs> so, back in the day, well, I still am a fan of Cathy Sierra, but I used to be a fan of Cathy Sierra's Head First blog, and it was a horrible moment when she was harassed off the internet in 2007. Um, and one of the things I remember from Cathy, the Head First blog, is bits of advice about doing conference talks. And the first thing is, don't do all the self-depreciation stuff. If you say, oh, I'm rubbish at talking, I don't know this, don't know that, you're pretty much telling people, you might as well walk out, there's no point in uh, listening to your talk. Anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really, I'm not a hardware person. Uh, I'm <laughs> a web developer, kind of. I'm a manager, let's face it. Well, I'm a web developer, kind of. And um, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know all the stuff about Linux drivers, and I, I don't even know if it's called I2C or I2C. That's, that's, that's how little I know about things. Uh, but I kind of the point is, I don't need to know. Um, and I neither do you to get involved in these kind of things. Uh, from all the awesome work that's been put in by Justin and Frank and Garth and other people, it's come a, a, like a hell of a long way since I first got inspired with this stuff in, in Austin um, with Garth and Justin's talks there. Uh, the, the documentation, the tooling, uh, has just, it's, been a, it's, it's actually been a challenge to keep up with, uh, <laughs> with all the changes, but it's just got so much easier and easier and easier. And thanks. Thanks to the Nervous Core team and other people. So, so thank you, Justine, and also Frank. Thanks, Frank, and thanks, thanks, Garth. Would you like to take a moment to thank them for the massive amount of hard work they've put into making this stuff easy for people who don't know what the hell they're doing to do things. So, thank you. <laughs> and another tip I remember about the conference talking was, like, just launch straight into the subject. Uh, don't let the preamble, nobody wants to hear about yourself, your family, nobody wants to hear about who you work for, anything like that. So, um, <laughs> I'm from Cultivate, uh, we are hiring, uh, we're based in Edinburgh, uh, we've got, uh, we're mostly a rail rails shop at the moment, but we're moving into Phoenix, we've got a um, bunch of people here, uh, Dan, Kate, Alan, me. Um, and that is literally the view from our office window. Alan took that photograph. Uh, but, that's Edinburgh Castle, in case you're interested. Uh, but it's not really all shortbread and Scotch pancakes around there. There is a downside to working on our office. And um, the downside is there's this tunnel at the bottom of the road. And it's just plagued with saxophonists. Seriously, in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, sex off is coming in the tunnel and, oh, for goodness sake. That's, a, that's enough of that. You could, it's, it's kind of cool if you want to pass as a tourist, but imagine that coming through the office window for four hour, four or five hours on a, on a, during the summer, especially during the festival, it drives you to do some crazy, 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 crazy things. Um, <laughs> and it's not just one sex often, it's, there's, there's, like, there's loads of them, they just turn up, <laughs> play the tunes, keep going. Huh. So, um, on to building the, the robot. Um, so, I guess you all want to know, uh, learn, uh, want to hear about the process of building this thing. But, uh, you know, <laughs> why bother, really? What's the point? Well, I think there's, there's some good points. First of all, it's kind of fun to, a lot of us are um, uh, pixel pushers, where 
uh, moving bikes one place to another, maybe putting some pixels on a screen somewhere, and that's 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 pretty cool. But it's a, it actually making things move, do cool stuff. Actually, in the in the field, real world, it makes a lovely change, and it's uh, and it's it is honestly great fun. A bit frustrating at times, but great fun. The other thing is there is a straight road from prototyping things, doing something like this, doing something differently. Uh, to, to production, as Justin was talking about earlier, with the with, um, Goth Hitchens and he's got marine navigation stuff there. And that's not trivial kind of, oh, it's stopped working, who cares, we're in the middle of the bloody ocean. Uh, <laughs> there's serious resilient stuff put on there. And obviously, you, um, you want your brewery to be running properly from your Apple Watch. What? <laughs> Straight process. So the Nose project has been designed to make it easy to go from prototyping on boards like Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black, that kind of thing, straight through to production. It's, uh, it's, it's a way to get into the whole uh, Internet of Things bandwagon and all that kind of jazz. The other reason is I'm finding it really useful training for applying um, understanding OTP and particularly supervision trees. So if you're um, maybe starting to get into Phoenix and you're doing a few internal applications and you're not, you know, maybe you've got 10 users, you're not, <laughs> you, you're not really exercising that. Uh, it's, a bit, it's, a, it's a bit of a weak exercise. It's like those treadmill desks where you're going. Not <laughs> um, which point. Uh, I mean, I do extract OTP things out in the, in the, on those, but I'm not really, I'm not really pushing the boundaries. Uh, but doing things in hardware is a, such an excellent fit for, you have a process per output device, you've got a process per sensor, and you want these things to stay up. It's, it's a, it's a, and you've got to really think about your supervision trees. I'm, I'm, I'm finding that uh, a, a nice, structured, heavier OTP gym. To, to practicing. This is the, talking of which, is the rough supervision tree of the, of the robot. I'll go into this in some detail later, but we've got uh, the stuff about moving it around at the top there, uh, all living under the locomotion supervisor. Um, you've got process per the, per the stepper, for each stepper, uh, and uh, and at the bottom, we've got specific things like a process con to control the guitarist, the process to control the saxophonist. Uh, there's an LED in there, don't worry about that. I didn't, I didn't attach it. Oh, we'll go into detail. But let's get started. Let's, let's get started and let's pretend we're wiring up the saxophonist. And what we're doing is um, there's a button in these things, and, it, and it's been soldered to, uh, to bypass the buttons. So uh, these here are, uh, if you don't know, these are called the GPIO pins. Uh, Justin mentioned them earlier on the, on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, some, of them, some of them are GPIO, some of them are, uh, provide voltage, and some of them provide ground. And to fire off the Raspberry Pi, it's the same as just lighting up an LED for a second. So we've got one, uh, we've got something attached to one of the pins and then something attached to ground and, and red. That's, that's, so that's all we have to do is put a pin high and then make it low so, that it'll, uh, so the chip inside the uh, sax player will recognize it when it goes high again. So in order to do that, uh, we want to include the libraries that, well, that uh, Justin mentioned earlier. We've got the, we've got nose obviously. We've got a mixed branch because do way of doing things. Um, Elixir Ale, uh, just to remind you, is the uh, library that Frank and Lith wrote um, for uh, dealing with the uh, GPIO pins for um, not just Raspberry Pi, other things as well, I believe, uh, and also some of the other interfaces, uh, the I2C or I squared, whatever it is. All the other stuff. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and, and obviously, we want to be able to talk to it. So at the moment, it's using nose networking, working, which puts it up on Ethernet. Uh, as of this morning, I could get it on Wi-Fi, but I didn't really have time. 
Uh, the thing I like to do, because I'm a kind of a, uh, a long-term extreme programmer person. I've been doing a while. I like to do things test-driven. So we've got that plugged in. I won't show you the rest of the mix file because um, Justin showed it earlier. We've got all that plugged in with the dependencies. What happens when we run mix test? And as Justin did mention, uh, because uh, Ale has, uh, has um, C libraries in there, they won't compile on this thing here. And in any case, I want to I want to be running these things locally in 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 my local environment. Uh, and I haven't really seen what Justin's been doing with the umbrella apps and, and pulling things out. So. I need a strategy to be able to compile a thing locally on here. Well, I don't need one, but I do need one because I'm not going to do this non-test driven, am I? Am I going too fast? Am I this OK? Thanks. Good. Cool. Um, am I going too slow? Uh, so the first thing I did was to make the libraries only, in, uh, only included in, in production mode so I can run tests and IEX to try things out. Uh, uh, without compiling the libraries in. Um, and I pulled out some of the stuff that's in the mix file that Justin put together. Uh, I modified that slightly so that in the various places I'm passing in the mix environment. Um, so in order that, because uh, it's matching on, see where it says system, RPI2, and that gives you the uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi system. If it's not production, it just matches on. It, it just matches and returns nothing. And the same thing with the aliases. Um, I don't, we don't really, at this point, we're not we're not we're not compiling into uh, the Raspberry Pi two environment, so we don't need the specific nose things. And just for completeness, uh, I should mention that the uh, there's because we're not including libraries, but they're not going to be there in the applications, or else it'll it'll complain. But there's code in there which is using this stuff. And I think it sounds similar to what Justin was talking about with um, Stubbs. So I've um, conditionally compiled in um, things like the nose networking uh, and the GPIO using this uh, highly advanced uh, if clause. Um, may not be the right way to do it, but it's the way I do it. And hey, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, so the Nova networking pretty much just comes up, does nothing like it says. It actually, that's not completely true. I can make it crash all the time just to test some stuff out about it crashing all the time. Um, GPIO, um, same kind of thing, just uh, pretending to be uh, Frank's GPIO library uh, and firing up a gen server to, rep to represent each pin. Uh, but I've added some extra things to make it easier to test, so I'm saving state. So if you write to a pin, save the state. If you read from a pin, saves the state. And it'll keep a pin state, a pin, a log of the pin, the, a log of the state changes. Okay, so what that enables me to do at this point is to write tests like this, where if we play the saxophonist, uh, we want to check that the pin's gone high. Da, 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 da. And then the pin goes low, uh, so it'll play again. Uh, I've set the toggle time. There's a toggle time configurable for how long it stays high. I've set it to zero, so it happens pretty much immediately. Um, so the, the tests will always pass. So that's 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 kind of that's kind of good. Uh, I'm not testing the toggle time. That's just too much like hard work. For completeness, this is uh, uh, the saxophonist implementation, a uh, bit of the implementation code. Uh, it's not particularly clever. Uh, you can see at line 29 there, we're making the pin high in a voltage sense. And um, then we're going to turn it off after a particular uh, amount of time. We're sending a, a message over the send after, which is handled at 34 to uh, uh, 
to, well, line 35 turns it off. Um, and that's the, that's the test passing. Hooray! So we've got the test passing, uh, but just remember that we're, we're only doing the no stuff in production now, so I'm, we're, I'm passing in, uh, uh, we need to set, set the production environment when we're doing any of the no things. Uh, for some reason, the firmware doesn't, I should, mention, should I mention this, the firmware doesn't uh, do the compilation at this point. I'm not quite sure why, so I'm always doing uh, the prod compile. All clear? <laughs> Exciting stuff, eh? Uh, code. <coughs> saxophonist. We've got the saxophonist working. Next, let's, uh, let's take um, a moment to consider uh, locomotion, moving the, moving the thing around. Uh, because if you've got a saxophonist stuck to the top of your lunchbox, you're going to want to move the thing around, aren't you? And um, I've been using, I'm using these stepper motors, uh, which are incredibly cheap. They're like, I don't know, less than two euros. Um, even less than that if you buy five of them at a time from China. Um, they're not very powerful, they're not very fast, but uh, they are incredibly cheap. <laughs> I think somebody must have made too many of them at one point. Um, and they come with um, a driver board, which essentially you, you, you attach to four of the pins to a driver board. And you pass these through in each order. So a stepper motor just says, go to this position, go to this position, go to this position, go to this position. So if you keep telling it to keep going to these positions in a particular order, it'll turn around. And you can uh, control the speed by deciding how quickly you're going to tell it to go into these positions. Uh, you don't really need to know this, but it's actually, uh, it's actually geared. So uh, for one rotation, just moves the motor a little bit. But that really doesn't matter. In the same way that the saxophonist is written uh, in a test-driven way, um, there's a whole bunch of tests around the, each the stepper motor process, which gives some confidence that it's going the right way. One of the things was to make sure that uh, uh, the modulus arithmetic is working right, working right when it's going round and round. Easy mistake, to, easy thing to get wrong. Uh, see that, uh, yeah. So I'm going to stepping through each position, sending it the the command, and um, checking the position changes pretty boring and also for each of the pins which I've set up earlier if you go back here you can see that if you if you read down the way you can you can tell you can see the order that you're expecting the pins to go in um, although it's reverse it, we're actually reversing this point so it's up the way but I mean that's what I'm doing the union I'm reverse for I don't know I can't remember I have no idea what I'm doing And the stepper motor uh, is obviously under a supervision tree because we're doing uh, Elixir stuff and we put everything under supervision trees because we want things to be robust. And one of the things I want to think about here is what happens for some reason, some edge case, and the gen server crashes. I can't see that happening, but you know, it's the kind of thing you want to think about. What happens if the, uh, if the right stepper crashes and we're going forward? Um, what do we want to happen to the locomotion? Um, okay. Audio. <laughs> what do we normally want to happen when something goes wrong? What, 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 what's, the, uh, what's the thing we do in computers when it stops working? But we, we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be turning the thing off and on again because it's, got in a, it's because it's got in a bad state. What we want to be doing is having the application resilient enough to deal with errors. So the bit of the system which has gone wrong 
knows to restart itself in a known good state. And in this case, I think restarting itself in a known good state means as if it had just come up. So let's pretend this is something less trivial than a, some M&M stuff on a lunchbox. And going along, the right, mo the right motor cuts out and no good state is stop. What will happen then? The left motor will keep going and we're, 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 we're in an unknown bad state at that point. So we want to think of that, about that in the supervision tree. So I'm using a one for all strategy for all the things, all the things under the separate motors. So if one thing go, if one thing goes wrong, it always. I know this is all trivial stuff, but it's kind of it's stuff that I don't have to think about quite often when I'm messing around with um, with Phoenix things. Uh, and it's just nice to have to think about these things. So it all starts again. Let's let's try that out. So if I actually I haven't tried this from the from here. So all right, you can kind of see it going forward now. And uh, I. Kill process, kill, click photo booth because <laughs> it stopped, damn it. Well, it stopped anyway. Uh, I never really tried this with two monitors before. <laughs> <coughs> Didn't go around in circles is what I'm saying. Now I need to recover my mouse, excellent. Uh, and uh, uh, there's just a there's just a web interface here. It's um, I'm just using Plug, not Phoenix, um, because I I think the next step might be to put a Phoenix uh, Phoenix server in there. But um, I need to get the Umbrella app stuff working first because I don't want I don't want the whole directory to like a, look like a Phoenix application. I want it to keep things things separate. And it's really, really trivial to put the to just get the plug uh, stuff in. So it just takes matches things and and uh, stuff. This is um, yeah. That's the that's the interface. Jesus, I'm going through this fast. Does anybody want to take a break? <laughs> I'm pretty sure this took about 40 minutes when I went through it down last night. <sighs> who fancies an early... I oh, know it's... Uh, who fancies seeing the Ecto stuff early? Next step is... Uh, oh, actually, no, that's not... That's, that's actually countdown time I'm seeing. Oh, gosh, I'm going through this slowly. I did say that I would, um, it would be a Slack-controlled robot. So I can't uh, demonstrate the Slack thing live because of the internet. So um, this is, I have some videos of what happened, what happened earlier. Um, we don't need to write much in Slack because there's a, a Slacker library which tells us a lot about the nose, the, sorry, nose, the Elixir ecosystem. Uh, maybe about 18 months ago, it was all like people saying, oh, I'd like to get into Elixir for, for web things, but it's not like Rails. I can't, there's not a gem for everything. Well, actually, there's now a hex package for, for most things, and uh, Slacker thing is really handy and trivial. It's uh, you uh, just, just match regular expressions, and you can take action on, the, on those things. So I incorporated that. Let's see what happens when, when let's just try it. Let's re remote shell in. Uh, is this running? Oh, damn it. Spoiler. Why is my video not running? 
that, that, start the video. Right, it's not working because the certificate's expired. The Slack certificate's expired. Uh, hang on a second. What's the time? The time is 1970. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> 1970s. So uh, the Raspberry Pi is booting up at the beginning of the Unix um, epoch. So on the 1st of January 1970, I was about six months old. Yeah, I am that old. Uh, and the Slack API certificate was minus 45 years old. It was issued in 2015, I checked. Um, and that's causing some confusion in the, in the SSL libraries. What can we do? Let's see if we've got NTPD available. Spoiler, it is. Um, so just check the time. Um, Type, 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 type. Let's see what the NTBD is available because this is a bit of the um, BusyBox NTBD. It's probably different to NTBD you've got on your, your system. So we need just, let's just check the, uh, what we have. Okay, let's try this out. Um, might, as well make, well, might as well make it verbose. Um, don't need to demonize it, obviously. Quit after clock is set. And let's give it a, a, a server to, to uh, check with and Yep, that's, that's all worked, and it's now no longer 1970. It's, in fact, uh, last week, because that's when I took the video. NTPD, NTP daemon. Um, but as just mentioned earlier, with, with the um, system D, all that stuff isn't included. We're using um, Erlang supervisors for supervision of things. So. Um, We'll create our own uh, gen server for NTPD and we'll put it under a supervision tree. Okay, we're ready to go now with the Slack bot. Well, not quite because we're being uh, stalked by a Trifid. No, um, that's the. Um, this is about the network coming up and down, so I can't, remo I can't um, remote in to take the video. So I improvised. Uh, Slack uses HTTP uh, poison. Uh, if, it, if you try using HTTP poison on this, it doesn't actually happen on my machine before you bring the network up. For some reason, and I should really look into it, um, it never actually, the, no domains ever resolve again. So we want to make sure that we don't start trying to connect to Slack before or any external thing before the networks come up. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. This actually does it the other way around and it does work, so let's just skip that. <sighs> other thing we need to think about with Slack is, uh, you know, connect connectivity goes down. What do we wanna do? What do we wanna happen when connectivity goes down? Well, let's take you back to French Guiana in 1996 to have a think about what happens when uh, uh, things go wrong in, a, in software. Attention for the final decision to go was taken. A final decision to go was taken. Neuf, huit, set, six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, unité, ouf. Allumage. Decollage. Looking good. Merde. 37 seconds into the launch. 
the onboard computers to... <laughs> what the hell happened there? Well, uh, funny story. <laughs> um, we used to go from RM4, 16-bit, uh, and uh, there was a RM5, 64-bit um, buffer flow over buffer flow overflow occurred. But the funny part is that it's, it was in the um, calibration code for the inertial reference system, which is the navigation system. And the calibration code only needs to, is only running before takeoff. So once it's taken off, does it need to run? But if the takeoff's aborted, it takes a long time to reboot boot up again. So uh, they, ran it, they run it for 40 seconds after takeoff. <laughs> so um, about 20 seconds into the flight, there's this buffer overflow, uncalled exception, takes down the entire navigation computer. At this point, we're going at the speed of sound, and the, and the, the thing says, oh, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> speed of sound doesn't, doesn't work out well. Um, so uh, what I want to think about is what happens when slack goes down? What happens when the slack goes down is the, the slack bot will probably will crash. Supervisor will restart it. Slack bot will crash again. Supervisor will restart it. Eventually, unless you've got some crazy supervision strategy in there, which is like, million restarts in 10 seconds, uh, the supervisor will go, ah, I've had enough of this, and uh, throw the problem up the supervision tree, go up the supervision tree, Eventually, your application crashes because this non-important part of your system, because there's a web interface, can't get connectivity. Um, so overall, supervision, supervision tree considerations for the uh, slack bot and the networking. Um, Ethernet similar. Uh, have a thing where the when it was using um, DHCP and it couldn't get a, uh, a network address, it would just crash. Uh, quicker could just either because you'd forgotten to plug the Ethernet in or because it was on our office network, which takes 35 seconds to come up for some reason. Um, Slackbot can't be allowed to connect until uh, the time's been set by NTP. Uh, no, Slackbot can't be allowed to connect before there's a network connection and uh, there's no point in connecting until the uh, NTP time's been set. And um, if a Slackbot keeps failing, we don't want to be throwing things up the supervision tree. Uh, this is what I've come up with. Uh, I came up with um, supervision tree. So we're starting off from the application level. Uh, we're bringing up this thing called the network manager, or going, well, called the gen server restarter. It is possibly the wrong approach, but hey. Um, which then sets up the networking supervisor, uh, passing in a Ethernet retry time. So it'll be if the Ethernet can't come up, how, of, uh, how, how often should I? What's the delay on the uh, retry? And a name so it'll look good in the observer. Um, yeah, and this is the restarter. Uh, it's just a gen server, which is. I, I'm saying this and I kind of feel like I'm doing the wrong thing, but it's behaving like a supervisor that just continuously restarts stuff. So it's, um, so you can see at line 15, it's trapping exits and uh, at line uh, 25, if, well, uh, if the, one of the children, when, when the child dies, it'll, uh, it'll send a restart after the retry time. Network and supervisor is a standard supervisor and brings up the Ethernet uh, and the, the, the supervisor for the NTP and the SAX. The, um, I have to stop saying SAX bot, I could just get that wrong. The, uh, <laughs> the Slack bot. Um, pass it. Um, uh, right at the bottom, line 21, there's a start delay. I can't, there's not really any good um, ways of knowing the network's up currently with nervous networking, so I'm kind of just waiting a bit and hoping it's come up. And if it's not come up, uh, the other things will have crashed and I'll stop it coming up. So that's why I've got a rest for one strategy at, at this point. Also, I started to change the NTP so that 
uh, previously on uh, if it fails to sync, it'll go, yeah, whatever, I'll just try again in 10 seconds, otherwise I'll try again in 30 minutes. But on the, when it first loads, uh, uh, that true equals do sync will fail and it'll crash the NTP thing. So, uh, so it'll take down from the uh, NTP supervisor. The NTP supervisor brings up the NTP and Slack bot and it'll take down the Slack bot, um, but not the um, not itself. So it's a rest, rest one strategy. I kind of feel that we've gone through that quickly, but uh, we're running out of time. So um, just to prove the Slack bot actually works, here's uh, a video I prepared earlier of the Slack bot working. Um, Do you ever take a video to show in front of a conference with 330 people and then later on think, oh God, I wish I'd swept the floor? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's popcorn down there. Don't worry, nearly dinner, nearly time. I did promise that I'd uh, acknowledge that uh, most of the soldering done in this project was done by my daughter, who's much better at it than me. Um, this is Florence, she's 10. <laughs> Here's the more information. Uh, the first place I go for, uh, for information is just in Shek's keynote, which he just gave. <laughs> Hopefully you were here for that. Uh, Nurse project, uh, there's actually much better information on the GitHub at the moment. Um, um, there's, my saxophone project is up on GitHub there. Uh, when he smokes cat feeder project, which is just cool. <laughs> it's like thing and it, the cat gets closer and it'll feed it if it hasn't been fed, but not like all the time. It's just kind of got, oh, you've already been fed. You wait 30 minutes. And uh, everybody's really helpful. Uh, Justin and, and um, Frank, especially in Garth, on the Elixir Slack channel on Nerves. Uh, sorry, the Nerves channel on Elixir Slack. And uh, I'm probably going to do some blog posts. I, I will do some blog posts for this, but um, um, there you go. And that's me. Fine, be like that. Huge thanks. <laughs>